9th, a regular meeting. Uh, we will have on the agenda uh, <clears throat> one item, the uh, replacement of the Medio Creek Bridge. If someone already knows that they would like to speak uh, from the public on that subject, feel free to send in a chat. And uh, Michelle uh, Weil on the council will just record that and you would be first in line to speak in that item when it comes up for public comments. Uh, you need to get attention. There's the raise hand feature, which is in the participants list when attention is called for, or if you want to raise your hand during a session. Okay. With that, I'll uh, call the council to order and ask Barb, could you take attendance? I'll do that. I'm sorry, I need to clear it. Yeah. Go ahead. Len Erickson. Present. Dan Haggerty. Present. Uh, Barbara Mathewson. Present. Da Dave Olson. Present. I am present and Michelle Weil. Okay. Present. Okay. All, all, all council members are present. Okay, then could you call out the names of the two new members? Well, I could. They're not. They're not. Well, they're going to be sworn in as the next item of business. So we'll just make sure they're here. They're here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So. So would you be comfortable with me stalling and possibly doing my item? I don't see Don on the call just yet. I do not see Don yet. So that's fine. We'll go ahead with uh, your report. Thank you. All right, so good evening, Mid Coast Community Council members and members of the community. My name is Lena Silberman, and I will be providing a report on behalf of Supervisor Don Horsley's office at the County of San Mateo. COVID-19 response has been ongoing. Based on the state's criteria, every county in California is assigned to a tier based on its test positivity, adjusted case rate, and equity metric. These tiers range from yellow, which is the least restrictive, to purple, which is the most restrictive. San Mateo County is currently within that purple tier. On December 4th, other Bay Area health officials announced that they would impose new local stay-at-home orders. The County of San Mateo remains focused on following the state's existing metrics and process while reinforcing the public's responsibility to comply with existing safety measures. I will include a link to Dr. Morrow, San Mateo County's health officer statement in the chat. I will also include a link to the San Mateo County COVID data dashboard, which will give the most up-to-date information regarding COVID-19 in our county. I have also included a link to information regarding testing, which at some point, which at this point currently has a capacity of 4,400 tests per day, not including private organizations such as Kaiser. So that's just county tests. On the topic of the COVID-19 vaccine, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are both now under the review of the FDA. This will culminate in hearings this Thursday and next for emergency use authorization that <clears throat> almost certainly occur within the month. The federal government has pre-ordered doses from both companies and we are preparing in California and locally for the first deliveries in the next coming weeks, shipped within 24 hours after FDA authorization. California is driving planning and coordination with county health departments and has formed a vaccine task force to guide the rollout. We do have county members on that task force. The federal operation warp speed plans for a four phase rollout of the new vaccine across the nation over many months, targeting a first jumpstart phase as soon as authorized. The priority groups will be healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. At this time, we estimate that the first two shipments to San Mateo County will arrive in the next coming weeks and may be enough to cover about 24,000 of approximately 38,000 healthcare workers in San Mateo County. So moving on to Project Home Key, the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors voted 5-0 to improve the intent to purchase the Coastside Inn located in the city of Half Moon Bay as part of Project Home Key. If you want to learn more about information about Project Home Key and the Coastside Inn, I've included a link to more information in the chat below. The board also voted 5-0 to allocate additional CARES Act funding as followed. $1 million to provide small business grants in targeted zip codes, $450,000 to the Child Care Relief Fund, and $150,000 to nonprofits that are associated with the arts. So this money was previously allocated to assist owners of small residential properties, 
However, the need has been less than we were expecting, and so it is now being reallocated to these three or these three different groups. I will include resources with more information in the chat, and I will also include a link to San Mateo County Strong, which is a one-stop shop for COVID-related resources. On disaster preparedness, Supervisor Horsley and his chief of staff have been in contact with Nicholas Calderon, director of San Mateo County Parks, to begin the process of creating a task force to look into the obstacles our county faces in fuel load reduction and how we can best to create a comprehensive long-term plan for a safer San Mateo County. Cal Fire and Fire Safe Council of San Mateo are also preparing for the event of post-fire related debris flows. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Anyone on the council have any questions? Okay. I do. Go ahead, Claire. I have two questions, please. Um, one is you said the business loans or grants were in targeted zip codes. Do you have any idea what zip codes those might cover? That's a great question and I do have access to that. I think what I'll include in the chat will have a more comprehensive list on that. And if it doesn't, I'll follow up with it. Okay, just wondered if it applied to any anybody out here. Uh, the other question is I've been kind of watching what the ICU capacity is here. And I know on the uh, dashboard, they have ICU capacity and then they have surge ICU capacity. Do you know which one we, we go by? Yes, that's a great question. So when we're talking about ICU capacity, that is not including surge capacity. So our ICU capacity is quite high. And then we also have the additional capacity for surge. That's unrelated to that first number. We don't have a whole lot of extra beds left. So I'm, I hope they're watching that. I'm sure they are. I believe Dr. Morrow is. I when oh, we, the governor is too. remember how much it was. Not okay. offhand, but it was pretty close to 15%. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rick Loman, you had your hand up, but took it down. Is that Just real quick, I was trying to figure out how to do the hand button, but I can't figure that out. Um, I might not have the latest information, but my impression was um, our health officer um, is not being as rigid as every other county around us. Uh, this doesn't seem like a good idea to me to open up San Mateo County and have everybody bring their viruses to us. Um, is that going to stand or are we going to shut down as every other county in the Bay Area? That's a great question. And I, I do believe it's close to every county, but I think there's maybe Santa Cruz didn't or Santa Clara didn't. Santa Cruz, thank you. Um, so I could answer that, but I would answer it, answer it much worse than Dr. Morrow does. So I will include his statement. He explains why. Um, and basically to, sum, to summarize it, it's that putting this order in place is more kind of in his mind, putting words to it. It's not, there's no, there's no real enforcement being added in a lot of ways. So for instance, a lot of the concern is if we don't close, people are gonna come to the beaches. Realistically, people are gonna come to the beaches anyways. And we don't necessarily have the capacity to put all of our law enforcement at the beaches and enforce that or close off our county at borders. So <clears throat> that's a very shortened, stupider version of what he said, but I'll include his statement in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Greg Diegas, a question? Hello, Greg, you have your hand up or are you mute? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably out of order. I wanted to make a public comment. Rick and I have a couple of topics, but that'll be later. You'll tell us one. Okay, <clears throat> we're good. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, we'll interrupt. I think we will be getting to uh, other Lena, public. Of Hello? Question for uh, Lena. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, Lena, um, in regards to the approval of the um, purchase of the Coastside N, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an understatement to say that this is a, a very big topic and um, <clears throat> board supervisors have already made their decision. Um, I'd like to request <clears throat> through you that um, we start to develop, the county starts to develop a, uh, we'll call it for now a fact sheet as to um, you know, all the information that the public wants to know, and this is gonna 
simplify, you know, um, contacts to the county and uh, just be a little proactive and start building a, a list. And it should probably should be a, a living list that uh, can, can change as, as time goes. Um, you know, one thing is, you know, uh, so that the community understands the success rate of the, uh, of the program, you know, uh, all the costs um, that the taxpayers will, will be paying. Um, uh, you know, if we can, you know, success rates of programs in, uh, I don't know if there's any in uh, Pacifica, uh, I know that the one that's uh, over the hill, um, you know, just, just start to list all the examples that are already in place and how it's working. Um, and if possible, uh, suggestions from their communities, um, ideas that the, their communities are, are putting out to make things better. It's overall, it's going to be a, a, a large tax dollar investment. And, and uh, you know, we want to make sure that uh, uh, our, you know, that, that the problem is, is really going to, is going to get better and not worse. Um, there's a lot of people that are very concerned that uh, by taking this move, things are going to get worse down here. And um, so I would just recommend, you know, being proactive and start putting a fact sheet together. And uh, I think the community's going to be watching this very closely. So uh, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. That's a fabulous idea. And I'll, yeah. I'll report that back to the supervisor. So Greg, back to you. Did, did you have a question for Lena? Your hands back up. I, I didn't know how to lower it. Uh, no. I don't have a lower button. No. I'll lower it. <laughs> I'll take care of it. Okay. I don't see it. You just click it again. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Lena. Um, at this point, we'll uh, interrupt there. And we have Supervisor Horsley here in our meeting. So we had as a first item of business, the uh, installation of our newly elected council members. So Don, are you ready to take charge there? I am. Good evening. Uh, I was listening to some of uh, Lena's responses. So uh, good, uh, nice job. Um, just to give you a brief thing about the, the, uh, our health director, he does not believe that um, outdoor eating is the spread of the illness, nor does he believe that children and playgrounds spread the illness. So that, that's his uh, basic uh, premise. Um, and he does live on a coastside, by the way, as you all know, I'm sure. Okay, so I'm going to have, there's three new members. Um, and I would have each, which you're supposed to, there's, somebody put up a two, no, it's three, isn't there? There's two new members and an elected member who has been reelected. Okay, one, one reelected member. Okay, so what I'm going to have you all do is you're going to raise your right hand, repeat after me, I'm going to, I'm going to say I, and then you're going to say your name, okay? So, I. I. Your name. I. Jill Grant. Dan Haggerty. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Greg, you're mute. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution, and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all, against all enemies, foreign, foreign, and, foreign domestic. and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true, that faith, bear and true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. In the Constitution, the Constitution of the United, United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the, and the Constitution, and the Constitution of, the of the State of California. California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take, that this, I take this obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. For a purpose of evasion. For a purpose of evasion. For a purpose of evasion. evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will that well, well, well and faithfully. Well and faithfully Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge, Discharge the duties 
upon uh, which I am about to enter. I am about to enter. Later on, I'm going to have at some other point. I'm going to have to mail to each one of you uh, that actual oath, and you have to sign it. And then I'll sign it as well. <laughs> it goes into a file. Don, Don, Lena has already taken care of that. I believe all of them do have that paper. Oh, document that. Oh, okay. Excellent. Congratulations. Look, work, look forward to working with you. Okay. Thank Stop. you. And welcome to the board new members and returning members, Dan. Okay. I'm going to continue with reports and uh, we have other public officials present here. Let's start with Harvey Rohrbeck. Uh, good afternoon or evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Lena said, the uh, Board of Supervisors on Tuesday unanimously approved the purchase of the Coside Inn. The City Council of Half Moon Bay has had two meetings, the last of which had 200 participants and 60 speakers. Uh, so that meeting lasted past 1230. Um, we uh, listened very attentively. Uh, and as a result, we wrote a, uh, a uh, request to the Board of Supervisors that the City Council would like to enter into a memorandum of understanding that will involve the uh, responsibilities of the county, the responsibilities of the city, uh, to answer what Dan was saying, some of the, uh, the requests for uh, measurements about the success of the program, uh, what's gonna happen uh, in the five year time span when uh, we might turn the uh, uh, co-site in into a uh, permanent supportive housing uh, facility. Uh, there are lots of things that still need to be uh, worked out, but the county has agreed that we will enter into a partnership with the community because it's important that we all work together to make this a success. Um, and I am actually delighted that after I've been working with uh, uh, Supervisor Horsley, among other people, for seven or eight years now, to actually get some transient housing for our homeless population that at last, uh, it looks like we have the beginning of a solution. So I think this is something that's gonna benefit the entire coast side. Um, yeah. uh, the other thing I wanted to report on is tomorrow at 5 p.m., the city council subcommittee on public safety is going to have its second meeting uh, there has been a long report that's uh, written about the history of public safety in Half Moon Bay, uh, how we've dealt with the uh, Sheriff's Department and the uh, City Police Department prior to that. Um, and public safety is a real uh, important issue for the entire coast side. We share the uh, the Sheriff's Department with the unincorporated Midcoast. So I encourage everyone who's interested in what we're doing about public safety to attend the meeting at five. It won't be the last meeting. There's going to be a lot more next uh, next year, but it's a it's a good start. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, Claire, your hand is up. Did you have a question? Not for Harvey. I had a, a feedback piece for Lena. I can do that after Harvey's finished. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Sid? Hi. Yes, Harvey. I was just uh, listening into the fire board meeting, which, as you know, overlaps this one. And um, uh, Deputy Chief Cox was giving a really interesting presentation. Unfortunately, their Zoom meeting dropped out, but um, he was talking about the uh, Cal OES and how it breaks down into different divisions and everything, and it's coordinated throughout the county. So you might ask him or invite him to go to that meeting that you're having tomorrow at five, because I know fire, um, as you know, because you used to be a director, they uh, 
they respond to a lot of our emergency things. And um, they also are very concerned about the fuel management, which we've had trouble with <laughs> recently with the big fires and everything. Um, <clears throat> But one question I had for you when it comes to the homeless shelter, if I guess they're gonna have it opening before the end of the year and on a trial basis with a few residents. And um, since the fire district funds the ambulance, um, do you have any idea if that shelter is gonna be needing more and more ambulance service if there are like psychic outbursts or drug overdoses or anything from some of the homeless that are going to be there because I know Supervisor Horsley did indicate that he was going to staff up more sheriffs because of the problems that he thinks might happen. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that uh, if we do need more services from uh, the sheriff's department, they will be provided. Um, the thing that a lot of people don't seem to get is that the homeless people who are going to be living in that uh, shelter are already there uh, on the coast side. They're not there at the creek, they're uh, in the fields. So the requirements uh, for services uh, like ambulances shouldn't really change very much, whether they're living in a congregate facility or um, uh, in the creek, um, but- if You have a management company taking over, they may make calls instead of just letting a guy, you know, fight it out in the creek on his own. So that's what I asked, because I remember that there was, we didn't staff a lot of ambulances and a lot of times they're needed for cliff rescues or somebody goes over a devil slide or there's a drowning and that sort of thing. So how many ambulances do you think we have now in the fire department that are stationed here to take care of things? One. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. If they end up taking people from that facility over the hill for you know emergency trauma things or any of that, will be short, shorted out, I guess. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thanks. You're Thank welcome. You good. Uh, Dave? Uh, yeah. Your hand was up. Uh, no. No longer. Okay, thanks. Oh, that's the reaction hand. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you, Harvey. Um, Claire, you had another question for uh, Lena. Yes, I partly due to partly with help from Michelle Dragony. Is that how you say your name? I, at any rate, um, and from looking yes. at the charts while you were uh, talking, uh, it looks as though we have about eight to ten percent capacity left in general acute beds and about fifteen percent capacity in ICU. Uh, I assume this means that that the count that the state orders will kick in very shortly. Uh, the, the state has open playgrounds; they're no longer closed. Um, I'm just noting that a few weeks ago we were chugging along with about 40, 50 cases a day. Today we had 385. Uh, I agree with whoever said uh, we need to be more careful than we are, and uh, not just you know even if even if there is no enforcement for increased. Um, carefulness, I think just the moral persuasion of saying we need to do it is worth serious consideration. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Rick Lohman, are you here uh, with someone from MWSD? Uh, not officially. And I think Craig or maybe Jim will be commenting on our latest MWSD news. So uh, I'm just here for public comment. Okay. Um, so is someone else from MWSD wanting to speak now? Don't see anybody. I, I, I'm, I'm here. Um, I hadn't planned on speaking on behalf of MWSD, but I'll give you a report. Um, the main thing, um, the main thing that we covered, um, um, at the meeting, uh, last Thursday is that we talked about the, uh, Montera mountaintop being shaved off, the top seven or 10 feet being shaved off by the uh, San Francisco Public, uh, SFPUC, San Francisco Public Utilities 
division uh, in, in order to make uh, room for a rain radar. Uh, they, hadn't, um, they hadn't notified anybody on the coast side except apparently maybe Half Moon Bay. And um, we asked, we hiked up to the mountain a week ago and met the, um, the, uh, the uh, SFPUC um, uh, executives and they agreed to hold off on construction and that they would consider putting the radar in a side location next to the peak and that they would uh, put the peak back into position. So we're, we're gonna follow through on that. And, um, and it was a positive meeting on top of Mount Montera. And we had a lot of community input on the issue at the last meeting Thursday. So we hope that uh, these things will happen and the um, uh, peak of Montero will be um, reestablished and put back the way it was uh, before. Any, uh, anyone else want to make comments? That was the main, that was the main uh, focus of the meeting. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. Uh, MWSD. You want to add anything, Rick? Yeah, just the other item. Uh, before that area was all fenced off too, they have also guaranteed that they will provide free, open, public access to that site forever. So lots of good things happened. Thank you. Jim, well, I, let, to let me just add, I'm, I'm gonna have an article on this in Coastside Buzz tomorrow. I had a meeting today with the regional director of USGS and the NGS about the marker. Clemens, I pulled into the call. There's a lot more to be discussed and I would disagree with my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Lohman. There's no guarantee. There is a statement of intent to reconsider. So this will take continued attention, but I applaud the effort by Montero Water and Sanitary District to get this thing at least started in reverse gear and uh, read the article tomorrow and you'll have much, much more detail. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Greg. I do not see anyone else here with public office. So that will close this item. Uh, next we have, uh, Item number two, public comment for items not on the agenda. Does anyone wish to speak here? If you do, please raise your hand. I see Rick's hand raised. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to, obviously as a former uh, MCC alumnus here, the, um, I'd like to thank all the people who ran again this in this election and got elected and all the people who are already on the council and serving. Uh, you folks do a great service for the community. I know it's a lot of work. I've been there. Um, the hardest thing we had was always trying to gather public input on items. And I would just encourage you to try to optimize that as best you can under these awful conditions. And I think you're doing a great job. Uh, the specific item I have is a meeting or so ago you folks um, basically approved the Caltrans request to put in several of those large, uh, I call them freeway traffic lights. Um, Har Harvey corrected me a while ago and said there were five of them going in on the coast. I just knew about the couple of northern ones. Um, my comments are based on the coastsiders are a very active, involved group. Um, they don't take real kindly to folks like Caltrans telling them what they're going to do. Um, you folks probably all know about the tunnel. Caltrans was gonna come in, blow up Montero Mountain and put a big freeway through. Coastsider said, no, you're not. And we got it on the ballot and we blocked it. And now you've got some huge tunnels. Immediately after that, Caltrans put an undocumented big freeway traffic sign up on our side of the tunnel. Uh, Coastsiders said, no, that's not in the plans, called the Coastal Commission. Coastal Commission said, take down that sign. It's not in what we approved. So these folks are active. Uh, a while ago, there was a big study about uh, crossings in Moss Beach to Montero. Uh, lots of big proposals were made including, as I understand, like 75 signs, flashers, lights, and a whole bunch of things to basically urbanize that entire corridor. Co-siders said, no, that's not what we asked for. 
we don't want that. And that stopped back then. Now it's evolving possibly into connect the coast side. And I'd encourage everybody to stay active. My impression just from the meeting before is that you folks approved it on the condition that they would, the big signs would only be used for emergencies. Um, I've been told that that was the same thing that happened on Highway 50 going up to Tahoe. And after they were installed, they just became used for everything again because Caltrans doesn't listen to people. Uh, my request is, um, I would like to know if you folks could re-agendize this for a little more input. Um, the Moss Beach folks and Montero folks tend to be possibly a little more isolationists than other parts of the mid coast. And um, my thoughts of having these huge freeway signs throughout the community is not a good thing. And it's not something we really want here. Uh, we'd like our smaller coast side look and having these big freeway billboards I've actually been driving down where these freeway things, they're like multiple messages. And if, if you're trying to pay attention to what's on that sign and read both messages as you go by at 70 miles an hour, um, you're not gonna, you can't get it. And to me, it's a distraction. So I would ask if you folks could re-agendize that for more public comment. I just don't think that's a huge benefit to the coast and uh, the look of those in Moss Beach and maybe even Montero uh, is a huge detriment to our communities. So if you folks have time, I'd like to see you re-agendize that for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. As you know, we cannot speak back to that. Um, I do not see any other hands raised for this item on the agenda. So Len? Um, yes, Dave. We do have one person on the phone tonight. Um, so for that person on the phone, if you want to speak, press star nine. That's the equivalent of raise hand. And if you are muted uh, by me or somebody else, you can unmute with star six. Um, if you can't make any of that work, uh, when there's a lull, you can speak up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item three is our consent agenda. We have one item, the minutes for the November 18th meeting, special meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Thank you. A second? I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Claire, could you go ahead and call roll? You're mute, Claire. Lynn Erickson? Yes. Greg Diegas? Aye. Jill Grant? Yes. Dan Haggerty? Yes. Barbara Matthewson? No, Barbara's not on anymore. No, I think she's supposed to, be, they're all supposed to be on for a while. Not to vote. Not to I vote? Okay. Um, Dave Olson? Yes. Uh, I vote yes, Michelle Weil? Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Claire. Okay, next is our regular agenda. The first item on the agenda is the replacement of the Medio Creek Bridge on the Coastal Trail. We have especially additional input from the county. This is the item for this item. We have two new members on the council who will be uh, able to act as council members. And we've also asked uh, Barb Mathewson to take that same role as well. This is a continuing discussion item and will affect passes forward to the next council after this. So with that, uh, I think uh, we've sent out a note that summarized a recent letter that the council sent forward. And along with that uh, requested further discussion from the county. Uh, so we're here to have that further input discussion from the county. And uh, for that, I'm gonna reach out to a supervisor Horsley you have other people as well as yourself from the county. So would you indicate how you'd like to introduce the lineup? Okay, thank you. Um, I have, uh, besides Lena, four members of the county staff, uh, Jim 
Porter, who's our director of the Department of Public Works, Joe LeClaire from Building and Planning and uh, Coa Vo and Ann Stillman are both uh, engineers from the county. So I, I'm gonna let, uh, you know, I, I can just say that, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard from residents in that area as well that um, Marauder Road is, in fact, when you see some of the pictures that Jim has, you can see that the area has um, significantly eroded over time. And obviously because we've had these uh, king tides and rising sea level, that's uh, gonna be a continuing problem. I think that building, rebuilding the bridge in its current location is really the best option. I hope you would agree after hearing from our engineers. And uh, I'm gonna let them actually describe the, the, the project, but I have to say that I was out there with a representative from the city of Half of Bay and some of the residents as well. And if we uh, abandon that particular bridge, you're essentially asking us to abandon that whole neighborhood. And I'm not really willing to do that at this point. So with that, I'm gonna have, uh, let you, uh, did, you start did, did you want uh, Joe LeClaire or DPW to go first? I'm gonna have, uh, uh, well, I, I just assume to have uh, Jim Porter go first. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, my name is Jim Porter. I'm the Director of Public Works for San Mateo County. Um, uh, Supervisor Horsley mentioned some of the staff here. I'd like to also um, acknowledge Robert Stevens. He's a civil engineering consultant that's working on this project. Also with us tonight is um, Gil Terrell. He's the principal engineer uh, in our department that essentially runs the engineering group. And also Wensi Ning, who's a senior engineer, and this is her project. So let me try and share my screen here. Oh, host disabled participant. Yeah, well, I will have to make you co-chair. I asked earlier, but I guess. That Either that or I sent a, a copy of the presentation to Len. Uh, if you guys, you guys can drive or I can drive, it's up to you. You should be able to share now, Jim. All right, let me give this a whirl. Here we go. All right, let's see. All right, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, let me get to, hang on, let me minimize this for a second, hang on, one sec. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, here we go, okay. Um, all righty. Yes. I think if you're converting over to a slide presentation show, if you stop sharing and resharing, it may work. All right. You know what? Um, if I stop sharing and resharing. So would you like me to back out of this and start it again? Yeah, just stop sharing and then start sharing again if it's in okay. presentation mode. Let me do that. Let's see. We get out of this. It stopped. Okay. Now let's try this again. <clears throat> Boy, I really messed this up. One second. <laughs> I apologize for the delay. <laughs> Let me get this up. All right. Current slide. Okay, that should do it. And let me get back to the meeting. All right. Hmm. Can you see my screen? No. All right. Hang on. Here we are. There's see one. Here we go. Um, Okay. Let's see. How about now? It's coming. See? Okay. Yeah. Right, try to press on the slide the presentation mode. I can't get to it because of the, uh, here we go. There we are. Let me try this. 
from the beginning. Okay, that should be better. Can you see it? That's yep. it. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. I apologize for that. I'm, I'm an engine, I'm not an IT guy. Anyhow, um, I want to go through a brief presentation and then we'll be happy to answer questions when we're done. So, um, and also I'd like to um, thank Robert Stevens. Uh, Robert put together this presentation. So thank you, Robert. And Robert will be available for questions. Um, so this is Murata Road in 1972. You can see my cursor is on the bridge location. This was actually a roadway bridge um, that uh, connected Murata Road uh, quite a while ago. You can see the concrete arch that supported the road deck and the bridge itself. So if you fast forward to today, um, this is the underside of the pedestrian bridge right now. You can see a shot of the bridge on the right-hand side, but on the left-hand side is really what we're concerned about. And what you can see there is some severe resting of those structural steel members. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about erosion in this area, but the reason why this bridge was closed was due to concerns about the actual structural steel failing and not being able to take that load and that bridge collapsing. So that is really why this bridge is closed right now. Um, bluff erosion though is a large concern. You can see on the picture on the left that uh, the bluff has been eroding back steadily for some time. Um, there's pieces of the old concrete arch bridge that are still in place, but when you go out there, you'll notice that that concrete arch bridge is falling apart. It's literally breaking and pieces are falling. So whatever happens with this bridge, um, we would really like to remove that arch structure to try to make sure that a piece of concrete doesn't fall and potentially hurt someone. Picture on the right was from 2017 when we had some major wave action out on the coast side and saw some significant bluff erosion on Murata Road. So this is our crews uh, going out and putting in some, some stone erosion protection, some what we call riprap to try to protect that slope. Um, this slide gives you an understanding of what the usage is of this bridge and the, uh, the coastal trail in general. As you can see, there's an awful lot of pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic, particularly on the weekends. So if you do the math, um, you know, you've got over 850 um, bicycles and over 1,400 pedestrians a day on Saturday that were using this bridge. So it's quite heavily used. Um, so what is Murata Road Bridge surface? It's, it is the coastal trail. Um, so that provides the um, continuation of the coastal trail, both from the north and south of this Meteo Creek. It also provides access to properties um, on either side of the bridge. Uh, and it also carries some utilities. There's electrical lines on there and there is a sanitary sewer line on that bridge as well. Um, as we go from summer to winter, there are changes out on the coast side by the bridge. And it really has to do with the sand deposition. You can see in December, in the beginning of the winter, um, you start to see the sand pull back a bit and you see a lot more rocks. In the summertime, the sand tends to come up a little bit higher and stay there. Um, and then back again in February, you can see there's a bit of uh, sand leaving, but there's sand moving in and out of this location, depending upon the wave action in the area. So um, we did, or we have looked at potential alignments for this bridge. Um, we're pursuing replacing the bridge in its current location. And the reason for that is expediency. Um, this is the fastest method to get the coastal trail back in operation along the coast actually. But we did look at various other options, which I'm gonna go through right now. Um, one of which was uh, an option to go and actually, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, one option was to actually take a couple of um, paper streets right now or streets on Alameda and actually construct a bridge across Medio Creek um, and put the coastal trail on this road. Another option is to actually um, just take away the bridge and put pedestrian access down to the beach on either side of Medio Creek to allow people to get down to the beach and across it during the summertime. And then a final option is to uh, essentially formalize the detour and I'll explain what formalized means later uh, to bring people down to Highway 1 and then bring them back on the coastal trail. 
So again, the, uh, these are the alternatives. There's always the no project alternative that we um, evaluate as part of the as part of the environmental review. There's a uh, managed retreat by relocating uh, the bridge and the coastal trail to Alameda. Um, I mentioned the seasonal access, that's option three. We remove the bridge and essentially build stairs to the coast side. And then the fourth option is rerouting the trail to highway one, essentially formalizing the detour. And then the fifth option is what we're pursuing, which is replacing the bridge in its current location. So in terms of the no project option, um, there are you know, certain drawbacks to that. It would eliminate the coastal trail basically along uh, the coast. So this is gonna be tough on people that use the trail, not only for recreational purposes, but for biking to work uh, and um, essentially just to get through the area. We'd also need to have the utilities relocate their lines from the bridge. So um, that would be up to the sanitary sewer utility as well as PG&E to reroute, excuse me, reroute those utilities. And um, there is a potential for loss to tourism. That's uh, you know sort of a, 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 a projection. It's really not um, proven at this point, but um, it would be an impediment to access along the beach. The other option is, is what is called the managed retreat option. This is also called the Alameda option. And that is to reroute the, um, the trail onto Alameda. We would construct a new bridge across the um, Medio Creek in that location and um, essentially formalize the trail on Alameda. Uh, that would require us to gain easements and potentially um, property and fee to construct a bridge. And what that means is we would need to get a right from the property owners in that area to build the foundation system, to build the bridge, and also to have temporary construction easements to do that. We would also have to relocate the utility systems out there. Um, it would take quite a bit of time to do that, um, but it is a long-term solution. I will say I have heard from the community on Alameda and um, all of the feedback that I have is negative. Um, if you walk out to Alameda, those are essentially two cul-de-sacs right now. And I showed you earlier what the daily average use of that bridge is on the weekends. That would be a significant impact to those cul-de-sac streets right now. Um, this just shows what that could look like. Um, this is a very conceptual design, but we would go in, we would construct a bridge from the end of Alameda to the other end of Alameda we would go in and likely pave uh, the dirt section of Alameda in here, and um, that would be the new coastal trail. The other alternate is essentially the same alignment, but it merely adds a class one bike and ped path along this, uh, along this area. Again, um, this would bring a lot of people onto Alameda, um, but it is the closest option to, um, to the current location. Um, as you can see from this photo, there is a, oh, sorry about that. There is a vacant lot right here. I'm not sure who owns that, but there's also First Avenue here. Um, if this type of an option were pursued, there would need to be a purchase of this property, but we would still be facing the same issues with um, bringing, you know, a lot of people onto a street, which is First Avenue, which doesn't see that kind of traffic now. It's, it's essentially a uh, cul-de-sac. So option three is a seasonal access. This is actually building stairs down to the beach. Um, this would allow people to access the coast, uh, certainly in the summertime. As I showed um, during the winter with the wave action, it would be difficult to get down there. You could get down there on low tide, but um, it's not ideal. This still requires utility systems to be relocated. Um, it would be essentially a system of stairs so there would not be uh, ADA access right there, which could pose a problem, but it does provide good beach access. This is kind of what it could look like. Uh, we could put in stairs leading down to the beach along where the current um, concrete arch structure is now. So that is an option. Um, although, as I said, there are some drawbacks to that option. Alternate four is to formalize the, um, the current detour that we have now. So it essentially bypasses folks out onto highway one. Um, 
in order to do this and not bring people across the highway, uh, we will want to pioneer a new bridge, pioneer, construct a new bridge on the west side of Highway 1, right along the highway. Um, this is quite a way from the coast side, though, from the coastline, so it would be a somewhat significant detour for folks to take. But this is an option that, that certainly is viable. Um, we have not talked to Caltrans about this, uh, so they are not aware of it yet. Um, but if indeed we are not given permits for the current location, this will be one of the options that we explore. Um, this is what this looks like. Uh, this is an aerial view where I'm sure you're familiar with the current detour, but it takes us out to Highway 1 uh, and then back out on Medio. This bridge that we would pioneer would be in this location, and I'm looking at the left-hand um, picture. Just to the, uh, it would be uh, on the west side of Highway 1. There's a dip in here. We would need to bridge that gap and then build a class one bike path along the um, highway one right away uh, between the fence line of the homes and the highway itself. So that's, that's an option as well. Um, and then the current option that we're actually pursuing is to replace the bridge uh, in its current alignment. So what this does is it reuses the existing foundations. Um, we are changing the strategy on the material from uh, the bridge from a steel bridge to an aluminum bridge. Now, technically this will give you 75 years of life. I think practically what will need to happen out here is we will put a bridge in and then over the next um, decades, we'll look at that alternate option either to relocate to Alameda or to Highway 1 and um, pursue that or plan for that uh, when the um, bridge that we will be replacing becomes untenable any, anymore, either through the um, bridge reaching its end of life or through coastal bluff erosion in that area there. But the plan really is to try to get a bridge in its current alignment because that's the quickest path right now to open up the coastal trail. And um, uh, then knowing that that is not a permanent solution, begin exploring other options. So that is, um, that is that plan. Here are some renditions of what that'll look like. And this is what the project will look like. So we'll come in with an aluminum bridge. I'm looking at the top photo. The depth of the span is greater than or deeper than the steel bridge because aluminum is not as strong as steel. So these trusses have to be larger. So although we're using the existing foundation and we're gonna keep the trail deck at the same elevation, the actual depth of the bridge structure is going to be uh, greater than before. So there will be a little bit more bridge uh, depth below the deck. Um, we're also going to come back with a shotcrete wall, which is basically um, concrete that has been reinforced and attached into the bluff with rebar to protect this bluff from coastal erosion. Uh, the way that'll be constructed, these are this is kind of an artist's rendition of what those rocks are that you see there every day. We'll pull those rocks back, construct the um, the uh, shotcrete wall and then bring the rocks back on the toe of that slope to provide protection from erosion there. Uh, we'll also build a shotcrete wall on the south side of the bridge. So that'll provide protection to that bluff and um, that will be the project. And this is kind of a plan view from the ocean looking inward towards that, what that might look like. Um, these are some details about what a shotcrete wall looks like. Again, we'll be um, building a wall you run rebar into the bluff, um, that anchors in, that's what ties the concrete into the bluff. And then the erosion protection on the bottom will um, provide some protection from erosion. Uh, the summer sand, as you can see, comes up pretty high. Uh, the winter sand is pretty low. Uh, we see a range, it says eight to nine feet. Um, that is a big range, but I'm sure that you've seen quite a bit of movement of that sand um, between summer and winter. So in terms of where we are, we're currently um, in the permitting stage. We've gone through feasibility studies. Uh, we've gone through CEQA review. We're right now in permitting. We will have this bridge um, hopefully permitted and designed by uh, next spring. And we should be in construction 
in the summer of 2021. Now that is dependent upon getting all of our permits. So there are four outstanding permits, one of which is with the Coastal Commission. Uh, we require a permit from the Corps of Engineers. Um, and there are two other permits, uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board and another one that escapes me, but uh, my staff can step in if you really wanna know the details on that. Uh, but that is the project in summary. And with that, um, that concludes my presentation and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yeah, if I could just make a quick uh, uh, comment about the option five, basically uh, that the last one that uh, Jim showed the uh, bridge in its current location. If you notice that, what it does is really is a, is a way of protecting that Marauder Road. And I know that uh, Dave Olson, and I, I think it was somebody else from MCC, a few years ago, we looked at all the whole area and we thought about what happens as that kit continues to erode. And we did at one time think of about a project for a, I think, what do they call it? A, um, a sheep wall to protect the Marauder. Yeah. Road. You, you know, you have houses and you have some business establishments that I think are really important to the coast site. Uh, we didn't think that that would ever, the sheet pile wall would actually work, but uh, we have continued to do the uh, rock, rock slope protection. And I, I think that by anchoring the road at the, the bridge and the medial bridge at the end and having the, um, the engineered shock creek of both the sides really commits us to preserving that entire road. And that preserves essentially that, that roadway because eventually if we, if we pull out and move our location someplace else and we stop um, you know, any repairs on that roadway, eventually it's gonna go. And I know that maybe it does, maybe eventually the, you know, the, the inexorable power of the Pacific Ocean and sea level rise, maybe 50 years from now, um, it gets over top, but at least for now, I think we're able to protect it. And maybe who knows what happens in the future. Maybe there are other kinds of natural ways of protecting that, that uh, roadway. I think it's important for the whole coast site. Um, so I, I would, uh, you know, I would hope that you would support uh, that, uh, that option. And I think the other advantage is it's gonna be a lot quicker. If we have to do Either the uh, move it onto Alameda or a bridge up off of uh, on the west side of Highway One. That's going to be years, years of work, years of of planning, and um, probably a lot of fights with neighbors as well. And I would, uh, I'd certainly like to avoid that. Okay. So Don, you're you're saying that if the bridge is built inland, it will take substantially more time to complete the project just by itself? Do you have an estimate? Well, I mean, you'd have to, I'd have to ask uh, Jim, but from what, of, he, he can tell you that the cost is greater. You're moving sewer lines, uh, PG&E lines, and you got to coordinate with other agencies. I, I think I saw some of the estimates that Jim had that was considerably more expensive. If I'm not mistaken, it was, well, I'm not going to say, but you, Jim, you, you probably have better, um, Give an estimate of the difference in the cost, but I do, you know, it's just pretty clear that when you want to essentially pioneer a new road, new bridge in a different location, it's going to be a lot more. It's going to be a lot more community outreach. It's going to be a lot more. You're going to, you're going to have to purchase land, and if the if the uh, per, the land owner doesn't want to sell it, we're going to end up having to go through um, eminent domain, which the county does not like to do. So it could be years and you could be stuck with that um, temporary, the temporary okay. going seven to 10 years. Gotcha. Jim, do you make, want to make any quick comments on those two points before we move ahead with questions? Sure. Um, it'll be several years before we would be able to put a bridge in. So we're two years into this project right now. So it's going to take three years to do this job. Um, and it's not the design that takes all the time. It's the environmental review process and the permitting. If we were to start over on a new alignment, um, that's, that will add in also a community process because we will be putting pedestrians and bicycles in a new location where they haven't been before. 
And um, I know Joe LeClaire is on the call. I can see him right there. Um, uh, what would happen was before we ever started design, there would be a large community process to talk about all the available alignments and what the preferred alignment will be. Having gone through these kinds of processes before, that's gonna be a year or two maybe before we ever start design. You figure it's taking us three years to uh, design, permit and construct this bridge. I would say the shortest you will see a new bridge or the, the quickest would be five years. I think realistically, you're looking at five to 10 like Supervisor Horsley was saying. Okay. Yeah, that's a more costly effort too, I assume. Uh, we haven't done cost estimates on it yet, but um, you can expect it to be as much. And if you consider what the um, CPI or the Consumer Price Index is doing, um, just the, the, the value or the, the increases in construction costs are going to add at least 25 to 50 percent just over time waiting. So thank you. So also we, we track with the Coastal Commission has sent you a set of questions to answer about that. Do you have an estimate on when you'll respond? Um, I don't. Um, I know we've got staff on the call. Um, Ann Stillman, are you there? There you are. Yes. Yes, I am. And we are, uh, we have responses, we're preparing responses, finalizing responses to the Coastal Commission's first set of questions. So I'm hoping that we get those out um, probably next week. And then they have additional questions that we're working on as well. But part of that requires um, some analysis that will take a little bit longer. So mm -hmm. that probably won't be for at least a month. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, next we're going to go to questions coming from the council. Uh, each council member will have up to three minutes for questions. This is questions and clarifications. We encourage you to be concise as we wanna to go to input from the community after this. Just so everybody is uh, following, the order I'm gonna call the council is uh, Dave first, followed by Claire, followed by Greg, followed by Barb, followed by Jill, followed by Dan and Michelle. Okay, Dave, could you lead off? Barb is not on the council. We, we said for this purpose, she's joining the full discussion. We're continuing from last year into this year. So we're giving her that option. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so a um, couple things, um, as, as some of you already know, GCSD wants to move the sewer line anyway. They're not fully committed to it, but they've done 95% of the engineering work and planning for it. So um, that will almost certainly happen. And of course, even if the bridge is rebuilt where it is right now, sewer line will have to be bypassed temporarily. Um, rerouting the pg and &E line should be pretty trivial. Um, so I think that's sort of a non-issue. <clears throat> um, talking about, you know, it might take five or 10 years to do the other options um, as, uh, Joe put in his letter to the council earlier today or yesterday, um, that process needs to start anyway. Um, and we all know from past interactions with both planning and DPW that resources are limited. If you start uh, rebuilding this bridge in place now, um, that's just going to delay the future planning. So that cost when it does move is going to go up no matter what, um, in my opinion, it may as well go up now. Um, and as I've said to almost everybody involved, um, I am not opposed if we could do replace the current bridge relatively cheaply, but it has a huge opportunity cost to replace it and then postpone the other work. And more than anything else, it's the armory. Um, it is my opinion and I think uh, Joe sort of alluded to this in his letter that the emergency armory that the county put in in 2017 and added to again in 2018 and 2019 and 2020 has all accelerated the erosion that is making the Arch Bridge fall down even faster. Um, and if you put in more armory there, you're just going to move the erosion further. So um, you will have to do those erosion studies no matter what. I do not believe you're likely to get those done in the next few months. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, perhaps your consultant can speak to that later on. That's all I've got for right now. I'll, I'll have more later. Okay. 
Thank you, Dave. Next is Claire. Um, I have just two comments. Um, there were a couple of things mentioned as um, if we looked at alternatives to replacing at the current site would be uh, things that would happen because of that that would be uh, undesirable. Uh, I would hate to lose that section of the coastal trail. I think it's beautiful and, and, and one of the best places we have. On the other hand, the coastal trail does exist away from the immediate coast, both north of El Granada and, um, and other locations um, on the coast. The, the fact that it is so close to the actual ocean is almost an anomaly. So it's not impossible to have the coastal trail inland, maybe even half a mile. That's certainly done. The other thing is the detour out to Highway 1 would not be too dissimilar from the proposed um, uh, coastal trail extension between uh, um, Wavecrest and, and the Ritz, where they're going to have a detour where uh, they bypass the creek there, uh, which is a pretty similar to the detour that we currently have in existence. So both of these uh, possible drawbacks to making any changes other than just replacing the bridge uh, do have precedent and, and are manageable. Okay. Thank you, Claire. Next is Greg Diegas. I want to just uh, um, build on top of what Dave was saying. I checked with GCSD. That sewer line is not active now. And in fact, they are moving inland permanently. I also suggest that the electrical conduit shouldn't be there at all. Um, one thing I noticed that the county is essentially willing to pay for doing this project twice. And I do understand that the neighborhood and the access um, lower immediate cost, faster, ration, faster restoration of service is the priority. So I, I get that. But how long is this going to last? That's one question. The second thing is Dave's brought up some points about erosion. And uh, I found them particularly alarming that the possibility of the shelter or reinforcement or the barrier, whatever you want to call it, is going to actually intensify the inland erosion and affect those property owners. So you know, I, I hope you have some kind of expertise or study to prove that that is not the case, because that would be a fatal flaw if it were. And then finally, um, Supervisor Horsley made an important comment about abandoning the neighborhood. I didn't understand that. Um, why would moving back abandon the neighborhood? Um, and won't we face the same outcome in 20 or 30 years? Again, that relates to my question about how long is this going to last? And then finally, Assuming the MCC is generally supportive of this priority, uh, is there something we could do to be of help with the CCC in getting you the permits? In other words, uh, overcoming any uh, any concerns the CCC has. Okay. Do you want to repeat the questions? Thank you. So um, I tell you what, let's, um, we're gonna go through the council's questions as a whole first, and then try to keep track of them as we go. Uh, Len? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you confused me there because uh, you weren't, it didn't sound like you were allowing continued uh, input from the council members. No, we're, we're going through. Barb is next up. Okay. Um, first off, I, I do agree with everything that Dave said. I I think there was too much emphasis put on the utilities because I don't I don't believe the utilities are part of the uh, bridge. Um, the uh, I still agree that I think the Alameda idea is is the better uh, better alternative. Uh, we were presented with plans for a uh, plastic bridge that was going to be put on uh, a month or so ago. Now we're talking about an aluminum bridge. Uh, the idea that this is going to last another 30 or so years, I don't think that's that's going to last. There's uh, the last time I walked it was in March and I walked it again today and I've seen significant changes. On, on the coastline since the last time I walked it. I don't think that the Highway 1 detour is, is an option. So I think that we need to look at some other, some other ideas. Um, and rather than keep spending money on something that 
um, is just kind of keep washing away is not is not to our benefit. And um, so that's all that's all my comments. But I do agree with Dave. Thank Thanks. you. Next up is Jill. Okay, so um, uh, are you taking questions and then they're answering later? Yes. Just try to see the, the whole list of questions and rather have it back and forth. Well, I have a question and then I have other questions based on the answer to, to that question. Oh. Take a shot. All right. So the bridge, is it prefabricated offsite and then brought in the aluminum bridge? You know, I'm going to defer to Robert Stevens on that in terms of construction methods. Robert, do you know the, the way this is constructed? Yes, the bridge is prefabricated and it's brought in in several sections and then it's lifted and placed. Okay, so so it's, um, I've seen that done before. Is there a way you can get an emergency permit to demo the, the bridge that exists right now and lay down that prefab bridge and then do the Shot Creek wall and rip wrap at a later time because that's going to take longer to get permitted. That is my question. Thank you. Okay. You got that one. Um, going ahead to Dan. Yes. Um, I'm very happy to uh, say that, that um, I am, we have found some agreement. Uh, between me and uh, Supervisor Horsley. I think that, uh, um, you know, I really do like the idea of rebuilding in place. Um, I believe the important thing to talk about is, is how the erosion is planned to be dealt with. Um, uh, <clears throat> I have uh, been keenly watching over the years what has been, um, been worked on up in Pacifica little bit but not exactly the same situation um where they put some uh shotcrete and uh i remember <clears throat> i guess it was probably about 2013 or thereabouts uh after they did some work up there went up and uh, witnessed um they have a staircase that lands in um it's called a uh, Es uh, Escalade Beach, I think, is the right lands right below Lands End Apartments um, in the in the Mannard area. Um, so they they built a staircase and they had shot Crete uh, up on the side. Uh, and I remember seeing rainy day. You know, there was an an enormous amount of water coming up out of a uh, essentially at the base of the staircase. There was a concrete uh, box with an open lid. And uh, there was just just an enormous amount of water gushing out at this at this uh, point. So um, I wanted to ask Jim and potentially the engineer about um, uh, you know everybody's concerned about uh, making sure that it works and that it lasts. Um, I wanted to talk about um, the idea of improved drainage. Behind the shot creek uh, wall, um, and in addition, you know, I think that there's the concern with. Uh, I did see from your drawings, Jim, that there was a, like a little bit of riprap on the on the uh, connection between the sand and the wall. Um, so um, I think that there needs to be, to some degree, a lot of drainage behind the sh the uh, shot creek. Um, whether that's a gabion wall with uh, with sleeves so that the uh, soil nails can go through, um, and then in addition, some type of a buffer at the base so when the waves do hit, um, it it really disperses. Uh, and there might need to be some sand replenishment on a maintenance uh, basis um, ar around to to really soften that blow from the waves. Um, and to make sure that there's plenty of drainage so that um, 
you know, the soil behind the wall doesn't, doesn't wash away. And I think that that is what was the problem with the project in uh, uh, Pacifica. Uh, they had to redo a lot of work. Um, but uh, I think we can learn from, from what is going on in Pacifica. It's very similar. So um, yeah, I'm interested in uh, Jim's comments and potentially uh, engineering uh, comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, in terms of questions, I mean, my, my quite, so the situation we find ourselves in is that, you know, it, a lot of us are concerned about the, the rebuilding the bridge in this existing location. Um, obviously, there's some challenges with moving it inland, but, um, you know, the main issue for me with moving it inland is the long, you know, the length of time it's going to take to to start from scratch basically and build this bridge. I think the, the main question on my mind is why wasn't the MCC brought in earlier? If work has been performed on this bridge or on planning this bridge for, I heard, I think three years, um, at least, you know, major initiatives have been in progress for at least one or two years. And we pretty much just found out about this um, when the bridge was closed in this past summer. Um, so that my question is for Supervisor Horsley or, uh, you know, or someone on this team, you know, why weren't we brought in earlier as the MCC, you know, it's our area that, you know, we obviously care a lot about and want to make sure that we do the right thing here. So I would like to understand that better. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. So, uh, Don, would you like to respond to that first part of the question and then we'll go back to Jim? Yeah, yeah I, I would. Um, Michelle, I don't think we really, it was really essentially, it was kind of like filling a pothole. It was, um, you know, originally all we thought about was this is all we're doing is replacing a bridge. It's actually be the, I guess it would be the third bridge. And it wasn't as if, I mean, yeah, if we were, if we had said we're going to abandon that and move it inland someplace, cer certainly we would have um, involved MCC. But it wasn't, it was just, it was essentially a maintenance project. And frankly, I, I, so, so I just looked at it as like they're, you know, resurfacing a road or, you know, so it's, a, it's, it was, it, in fact, we're kind of surprised, at least it caught me by surprise when the thing had to be shut down. I knew it had to be replaced, but again, it was just, it was just to, to me, it was just simply a maintenance issue. If I, I'd actually uh, go back to uh, Greg Diakos's question about uh, the neighborhood and <coughs> Have some time tomorrow if you want to go out there with me or any of the MCC people want to go out there with me and take a look at it. I'll be glad to show you what I think uh, or why I think this is really important to replace it in its current location. So I, if I could meet you there at 12 30, 1 o'clock tomorrow, I'm available. Can we do it? I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow. What, what, say, let's say 1 o'clock. Give me a chance to eat uh, lunch. What specific location, Don? Uh, right at the at the bridge itself, right at the, the media bridge itself. Which side? North side. Uh, let's take the north side. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. Good. Uh, anybody else who's uh, uh, you know who wants to have the commissioners also want to uh, be out there? Um, you know, yeah. Hey, what, Dan? Um, so yeah, Don. I I would love to be there with you. I yeah. really would, but I have a work uh, situation. Oh. Not allow. Uh, are there is there any way that we could, uh, you know, schedule it around, uh, you know, normal work hours? Um, I I, 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 can't, I can't. Yeah, I could do it next week if you want. If you guys want to do that, but I can't do it Friday. I have um, a joint powers board that I'm the chair of, so I can't do that. Um, Don, maybe you could give us a quick little uh, preview of what you would be pointing out on your tour uh, for those of us that won't be there. Well, I, I, I'd like to point out the erosion and how eroded that, that. I could take photos and I can take a video. That'd be good. That'd be good. Why don't we do that? So a, a question back to Jim that was raised. Several people asked about Shot Creek. One of the questions, Jim, for your team was a concern that it would tend to funnel the water in, the wave action in, and uh, extend or exacerbate erosion up creek. 
Uh, can you speak to those concerns? Um, I, you know, I might ask Robert to try to take a stab at that. Um, I have not read the, the, there's a sand movement study that's been done for this location. Robert, were you involved in that? I was not involved in that, but I can talk at least in general about this. So hi, my name is Robert, I'm the engineer. I'm also a Miramar resident. So I, uh, I'm here at the, at the bridge almost every, uh, every day. So I'm very familiar, I've watched it for the last decade. A um, couple things to point out. Um, as Jim showed in the slides, um, the sand is a very dynamic process. In the summertime, the sand is very high. And when we have big storms or, or big uh, wave surges, the sand starts being pulled out to sea. And as many of you probably noticed, we can lose five, 10 feet of sand in, in a given storm. So, you know, when the first storms happen, the beach is very high, the sand is very high, and the waves will crest and they will get up and they will strike the bluff. So in that case, um, early on in the winter, they'll actually be striking the concrete portion. As the winter progresses uh, and as the sand retreats, the waves may hit the concrete, but they'll spend most of their time interacting actually with the riprap below that. So while the concrete and riprap can change the wave patterns along a coastline, in this segment, we're talking about a very small area. We're talking about a very small area that's being um, armored with these improvements and that the vast majority of this area already has some sort of human made improvement to it. So we don't expect to have a worsening condition uh, upstream in the Arroyo de en Medio or in other locations along the coastline. Thank you. And then um, there was another question about the design of the shotcrete wall. Um, so uh, Robert, you're probably an expert in this. I know I'm not, but generally those walls are designed so that they will resist water from undermining the wall, both below and above. But maybe Robert, you can speak to that a bit. Yes, yeah, so the, the project actually um, promotes drainage from behind the wall. And if you think about it, you have a giant concrete wall here and below it, you have uh, rock riprap. So water that might be migrating behind the wall is actually gonna be flowing below the rock riprap. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joe LeClaire is here from planning and has shared a document uh, regarding the future here. Uh, Joe, could you make a few comments? Sure, thanks, Lynn, and, and thanks, members of the council, um, Supervisor Horsley, for the opportunity to speak. Um, as, as has been discussed, you know, coastal erosion is a big problem in this area. Um, and, and a large part, I think, because of the breakwaters that were installed in uh, 1960 north of here and really disrupted the sand supply system. Um, Along this, along this shoreline. I think we don't know what the real erosion rate would be along Miramar because um, it's been protected with riprap for over 30 years. And so it is not eroding as fast as the, um, as the shoreline is to the north. But before um, I came to the county, I spent over 20 years planning public access around the shoreline of San Francisco Bay and and analyzing sea level rise. And we do know that um, sea level is rising. It's rising about an eighth of an inch a year globally, um, but it isn't rising as fast along the West Coast um, as it is globally. And that has to do with oceanographic forces and so on. But um, I, I'm, I was really impressed by um, Jim Porter's presentation and the discussion that's ensued about, um, about different locations. And I do believe, based on my experience in, in sea level rise planning and, and, um, and what I've heard tonight, that the proposed location um, of rebuilding in place makes a lot of sense. I don't think the community is ready for, um, the community that lives in the area is, is, is sort of prepared for, the kind of adjustment that would um, uh, involve a, a inland relocation, and, and you know, I understand Claire and others' points of view, you know, on that 
question and, and there's a real, you know, there's some real trade-offs to consider with regard to cost effectiveness. But I think looking at the price and 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 the 10 or even if you got 10 or 15 years, 20 years out of this bridge, I think it'd be a very cost effective decision to rebuild in this location. Mm -hmm. With regard to you know planning's interest in this, um, we we simply want to make sure that in Connect the Coast side that that plan makes provision for um, the future when sea level rises and coastal erosion becomes uh, such a comes dramatic enough in this area that you have to have those relocation conversations. I'm not convinced that we're there yet, um, but. Um, that it, 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 you can make an argument, a prudent argument for, for relocating inland, but I do think it would take you know, a considerable amount of time. And, I, and for that reason, I believe it makes sense to build here and to, and to commit to longer term planning processes that look at not only the location of the coastal trail, which is what, you know, connect the coast sides focused on transportation and so, you know, we will we will touch on that, but I think down the line, um, we have to not just look at the coastal trail, but other infrastructure in the area that might be at risk. Um, and I also um, represent the county on a. I'm not sure if this is the other permit Jim was referring to, but the um, the National Marine Sanctuary um, does have jurisdiction over this area and. Um, sit on a group that is looking at sand replenishment um, strategies uh, for the uh, for the coast and um, trying to find ways to um, advance sand replenishment as a means of dealing with the near-term effects of sea level rise and coastal erosion and I think and 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 they've identified surfers beach as one of the projects that they want to focus on and um, sand replenishment in that area could affect the uh, sand supply um, down shore, including down here. So it could be that the sand, you know, does even maybe go up a little higher in the um, in the summertime when the when the waves replenish the sand, versus in the winter when the waves take the sand away. And that's a normal coastal process happens all up and down the California coast. It's not unique to this area. Um, so anyway, we are committed to incorporating a commitment to a community planning process to look at inland alternatives for this segment of the coastal trail um, in Connect the Coast side. And um, that's something that we'll be uh, working with our colleagues in public works to um, uh, better refine the proposal as, as we draft the plan, which we hope to have done and published by uh, 1st of January. Thanks. Uh, Len, that's all I have for you right hey, now. Thank you, Joe. Um, before I go to the public for uh, questions. Um, Len, I, can I respond? Uh, I want to ask a question to the engineer and, and, and Joe. There's a couple things that were brought up. Can you be OK? I do want to give the public a chance. Go ahead. Specifically regarding the, the drainage behind the uh, proposed shot creek. Um, I want to say, uh, I think it was Joe that said, uh, you know that it's hard to uh, understand the the erosion with the shotcrete, or I'm sorry, the uh, riprap that's been uh, along uh, 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 a lot of the parts south of the uh, uh, jetty. Um, I've been here for 32 years, and I've witnessed uh, a number of times over the years there there is a lot of erosion behind the riprap, albeit the riprap slows this erosion. But the water, the, the ocean water goes up behind it and eventually slowly uh, erodes behind it. And I think the same thing is going to happen with the uh, shotcrete wall. Um, Robert, you mentioned that the water will flow. Um, uh, you mentioned, I think it was the inland water, will flow up to the uh, riprap or the uh, shotcrete wall and then flow out you know, through the riprap into the sand. Um, <clears throat> clearly, we know that, you know, the ocean tides up and down, so the, the water is going to be going. Could you please pose your question so they can answer? The ocean, oh, it's specifically about uh, 
looking very keenly on improving the drainage behind the riprap wall so and with a, 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 a buffering type of a uh, concept so that when the water does and we know it will go up behind the wall from the ocean that it minimizes um, you, you know uh, washing away the soil behind the uh, shotcrete wall so that's mm -hmm. That's what I would like to be addressed by uh, the engineer, Robert. Thank, Thank you. you. Could you uh, speak to that? Was it Robert? You wanted? Yeah, so the, the proposed design incorporates um, rocks of various sizes to lock themselves in place. It also uh, promotes a series of engineering fabrics that are placed before the rocks are placed to help hold the uh, fine sediment soils in place. So that as the water washes in and out, it keeps them in place. And that's not to say that it's going to uh, be perfectly and not require any maintenance over a 40-year period or a 50-year period. There, there probably will be need to be maintenance at some point in the future. But are you specifically talking about behind the uh, shotcrete wall? Correct. What, what, can you explain the drainage behind the, what you're, as far as what you know now is being proposed? What kind of drainage is going to be behind the shotcrete wall? There currently there is no drainage tile or uh, that's proposed there at this stage of the design. Uh, we can look at that in, in addition. Right now we're using a series of engineered fabrics to keep the fine sediment in place. Yeah, I don't think that's water. Hey, Dan, thank you. So I want to go now to questions from the public. We have Pat Tierney, followed by Neil Day, followed by Ethan and Sid with questions. So Pat Tierney. Yes, thank you. Appreciate you having me. Uh, I'm a landowner uh, in Miramar that is located along one of the proposed routes, that vacant field that you were talking about. Uh, there has been a meeting of landowners in Miramar on this very topic. And 57 of them to date have signed a petition that says, one, to replace the Medio Creek Coastal Trail Bridge in its current location as soon as possible, and two, develop a comprehensive plan of Marotta Road and the Coastal Trail Corridor north, south, and east of the bridge um, through uh, a series of meetings. And I can tell you that the landowners on all sides of Alameda um, both north and south and in Miramar have signed the petition opposing that it would require uh, eminent domain. Uh, this is our home. This is not the coastal trail. Um, second, um, the landowners uh, are, the bridge is feasible in its being to be replaced in its current location. The county, and I've not heard anybody say it isn't feasible to replace it there. Fourth, uh, armoring on in the Medio Creek mouth uh, is both feasible and there may be additional alternatives that could reduce it further. Um, everything from natural uh, erosion protection of plants that grow here natively uh, to soil replenishment could significantly reduce any small erosion that happens in Medio at, you know, inside of Medio Creek at the mouth. Uh, uh, another issue that needs to be talked about is uh, One Shore, the county's group that is uh, designated for planning of coastal erosion issues is interested in getting involved with this planning process. So there are, a, the landowners are opposed to it uh, going on Alameda. They're clearly supportive of keeping it where it is. It's the quickest, most expedient way to increase coastal access. Um, and so, uh, and there is potentially through one source, one, one shore, a way to have a long-term planning solution developed. So uh, we, uh, as landowners in Miramar, support the bridge being replaced where it is and would like to uh, encourage the council to think beyond uh, their current position. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Next is Neil Day. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate having the opportunity to uh, address the council. Um, I'm a landowner at the end of Marauder Road, and I also very much support the replacement of the current bridge. Um, we find that it's a, a real um, a, a real benefit to the community. We love the visitors who come through and have met many, many wonderful folks who come to visit. Um, we think this is a, a, a great location for it, and um, we definitely would like to see the bridge replaced as quickly as possible. It also provides access for us and our neighbors to the north, and uh, it's it's definitely the most convenient way for us to, to get up to uh, Princeton Harbor and uh, the beaches north of us. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. The next is Ethan. Ethan? Ethan? Can you unmute, Nathan? Yeah, there you go. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, uh, my name is Miller. Uh, I live in a um, log log house, log cabin, right at the end of Alameda on the north side, right next to the creek. Um, family was raised here. I've been here 20 some odd years. Um, if I could, um, Jim, maybe if you're if you're still on, if you could pull up the uh, 1972 photo that you originally showed, I think at the beginning of your slideshow presentation. Yeah, let me see if I can get that up there. Thank you. Let's see. Uh-oh. That didn't sound good. <laughs> Hang on, now I gotta get myself back onto Zoom here. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, no, it's fine. I just got to figure this out. Let's see. Why don't you continue with your question and I'll try to, uh, try Dave, to figure this thing out. Dave's got it too. Dave? Oh, here we go. Hey, oh. Here, I got my oh, hat. Okay. So I, uh, as, as Jim is pulling that up, um, I, I think I've made clear uh, some of these points. Uh, yeah, let's get that 72 photo. One of the first. Let me get there. Uh, right there. I don't, suppose, I don't suppose you can zoom at all. How's that? At the, which, yeah, there you go. There you go. If you look at the north end of that um, abutment at the arch at the creek, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would challenge anyone to find a material difference in the erosion uh, in that picture at least and I'm looking immediate at the immediate north end of the arch abutment in 50 years okay has there been erosion certainly there's been erosion this is not the end of the world okay this can be handled now, whether that was caused, whether that was helped by the riprap along Murata further to the north, I don't know, but there was no riprap uh, from Medio south to the uh, abutment in 1972, and yet that area has not re receded materially. So yeah, there's erosion, but this is entirely doable. Look, the, the county has engineered this. Um, I don't think that there's a lot of dispute about uh, the engineering studies, the bridge can be replaced, should be replaced where it is. Uh, the Miramar community, the entire community is in support of this. The community is not in support of the Alameda relocation. I would, I would echo um, Pat and, and Neil's comments to this effect um, because the current location as Dave, you have conceded, the current location is feasible there is no reason in, in, in equity and in reason and law and anything else to take property. Taking a property is only a last resort that's done where you have necessity because we have a, an option right there sitting looking at us to do this. That means that Alameda is not necessary for this process. So please do not upend our neighborhood and do this. I would refer you all to our November 18 letter that set forth the many problems 
both safety and environmental and otherwise with pushing uh, you know, thousands of people down our street. I would, I would finally add that uh, the, the thousand or 1200 people on a Saturday from, night, from uh, two years ago study will pale in comparison to what we currently see in the COVID era. We have been absolutely inundated with, with tourists uh, and that's fine, we welcome them, but it's like on a magnitude of two or three times that now. Thank you, Ethan, we've reached your limit. Thank you. Okay, next is Sid. Thank you. Um, I did have originally one question, but now I have two. I'll make it quick. Um, for the engineer, um, I know that everybody wants you to build the bridge back where it was, and I sort of support that because I don't like anybody, any property owners having their land taken away because um, I'm a realtor. But by the same token, I also would like to know if there's any potential if you were to build that bridge and it comes in sections and something really catastrophic happened where you would have to move the bridge before the end of its useful life, can it be repurposed and relocated like out to the highway, for instance, or would you have to go ahead and spend the money and build a whole nother bridge? That's the one question. The second question is, um, well, it's kind of a statement really. Um, back when Jim Porter first took over, we used to have a Department of Public Works guy named Neil Cullen and out in Seal Cove, they decided to abandon the uh, Ocean Boulevard and it's continued eroding. In fact, my neighbor now has a huge crack in her foundation and she's gonna have to have that repaired at her expense. So whatever they're talking about on the, uh, um, I think the, water coming down Murata Creek, sorry, Medio Creek, um, you might want to listen to them because um, the water and erosion and everything else, we don't have any control over that. That's mother nature. But back to my main question was, I hope they can repurpose the bridge if need be. Thank okay, you. I got your question. Thanks. Jim, can you respond? Sure. So um, I guess theoretically, you could reuse the bridge sections. However, the problem is the span length. Yeah. Um, if we were to relocate, we would have to look at what that span is. And it's not clear whether that bridge would work. I mean, I've never reused a bridge other than a real railroad car bridge that you just mm -hmm. drop on, you know, drop over a creek or something. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult uh, with a prefabricated bridge because they're actually fabricated for the specific location that you're working in. Okay. So I think in theory, maybe, I think in practical uh, practicality, probably not. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, Jennifer Savage, uh, this will be the last comment from the public. Hi, thank you. I'll try to be quick. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm the California policy manager for the Surfrider Foundation. I'm sure you're familiar with our chapter in San Mateo. Um, I work on statewide issues, primarily at the Coastal Commission, State Lands Commission, State Legislature, and I don't usually, um, you know, drop into to local meetings, but I was so intrigued by this particular um, situation uh, when I heard about it, so I just really wanted to, to find out some more, and um, thank you for the great presentation. Um, just, I, I thought I would offer some thoughts, hopefully they're helpful and you don't mind, um, but looking at this through a statewide lens, um, I'm just really struck by the fact that, um, you know, every project should be appropriate for its local location, um, but we do have a lot of universal guidance. And I know that this is viewed as a bridge replacement project, but really what I see it as is a sea level rise adaptation project, because that's what we're, we're dealing with. And um, in alternative five, there was something about sea level rise being the limiting fact factor, but it's really the defining factor here. And, um, you know, we, um, we have a lot that we know about sea level rise, and we know that state agencies have been instructed to plan for 3.5 feet of sea level rise by 2050. And I mentioned this because clearly you, have, you know you have to get through the Coastal Commission. And so when you're thinking about the permitting process, 
that's the number that you should have in mind that you're working with. And California is actually continuing a pace with global rates. It's not less. It's just depending on where you are on the globe or as a state differences. But the overall factor of sea level rise is the same. It's all based on the, the current science that's come out. Um, and we know that coastal armoring destroys beaches. It does increase erosion and it's inconsistent with the Coastal Act because it increases erosion and destroys the beaches. So, um, so that's really something to consider as well. We also know that the coastal trail doesn't have to be adjacent to the water. There's plenty of places in the state where it's not. I mean, it's awesome when it is, but it doesn't work everywhere. And um, the Coastal Commission has rejected armoring the coastal trail, in fact, right in your neighborhood. Um, so that's another thing to consider. And just again, from you know the big picture view, with all of that in mind, I just would really encourage you to look at the, the long-term solution. I know that it's the hardest and clearly just in this little glimpse, I can see a lot of the controversy surrounding it, but, um, but it's really the most worthwhile way to go. And especially again, I would encourage you to just not, um, to, to keep in mind that you do have to be in compliance with the Coastal Act and, and you have to get through you know, the Coastal Commission. And so to show up with a project that isn't going to get through the Coastal Commission because it's going to increase erosion because it's inconsistent with the Coastal Act would just be um, probably not in anyone's best interest uh, from you know, an outside perspective. But, um, but as you move forward, I'm sure you're, you're working with Coastal Commission staff and will um, hopefully um, get to a good place with them. And so I just, um, again, wanted to offer some of those observations and I hope, I, I hope that that was okay. But this is a, a really intriguing project and, and a good example of things people are dealing with everywhere. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Jennifer. We've had uh, two more members of the public uh, raise their hands. The first is Kimberly Williams. Oops. Kimberly, are you there? Um, yes. Hi, Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I just want to say that um, this is Kimberly Williams, and I am a local resident. I live on the coast side. I have lived here for um, going on almost 14 years now, and I am also a representative of the local surf rider chapter. Um, so. I want to agree with everything that Dave Olson and several of other of the council members said in the beginning. I think there are several concerns here in, in from going from the first presentation that um, the supervisor staff made at, at an earlier meeting and what they're presenting now. Um, I think that we need to have all of our questions answered and we actually need a coastal erosion expert to educate us on this issue because there are a lot of misconceptions here and I'm hearing a lot of different things coming from everyone. Um, I do not think with all due respect to Supervisor Horsley that you are a coastal erosion expert and I'm not sure what information you hope to give to everybody on your walk tomorrow but I would be interested in joining that um, to hear what you have to say. Um, I sympathize with the neighbors who have spoken up and Mr. Tierney, I really appreciate your comments. I think that it would be helpful to look at more natural solutions to the creek because it is has been shown and I, I heard from another expert, I think after the last meeting that um, armoring inside the creek mouth will actually increase the erosion beyond that into the creek bed, thereby endangering the buildings beyond it behind the bridge. So that's another thing to consider. Um, we have an opportunity here to come together to create a solution that we can all be happy with. And I think this is also a financial issue. And um, I think we should solve this now. I think Supervisor Horsley has overblown the um, idea that this is going to cost us a lot more if we don't do it really quickly and that it's going to stretch out for a long length of time. They've proven that they can move quickly when they want to. And the engineers last time said that this would at least be a two plus years project. Um, I echo someone else who said that if we can help with the permitting process, we're happy to do that with the right alternative. And and if it is the right alternative that meets all the needs, 
then perhaps we could accelerate this project. Surfrider continues to support and encourage an alternative to putting the bridge in the same place it is now and to the coastal armoring that you're proposing. Um, it's, it's proven that it hasn't really worked. And uh, Dan Haggerty brought up Pacifica. Pacifica, all of their revetment is now failing. They are in a state of emergency trying to fix all the damage they've done over the years. And if you look at their beaches, our beaches are so much nicer and larger than theirs. And there's a reason for this because they have consistently um, engaged in coastal armoring and it has depleted their beaches over the years and it continues to do so. And we should protect what we have. We don't wanna end up like Pacifica. So um, thank you for listening to my comments and my questions and I look forward to more discussion on this. Thank you, uh, Jim Harvey. Yeah, uh, I, in response to Kimberly, especially now, um, I, I'd like to, uh, I think that uh, 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 armored armory and reinforced shot creek, Crete can work really well. And I'd call you to, next time you go to Carmel, Carmel by the sea, go down to the beach, turn right up the beach and along Pebble Beach, they, they have done ex a very extensive and long and very extensive and well done reinforced shot creek. And they have, um, and they have uh, it, it has lasted a long time. They've done a great job, it works really well. And where it meshes at the beginning at the end, they've made it so that there is no erosion. There's no erosion behind the shot creek. Um, you know, it can be done. I just want to reinforce that it can be done very effectively. And uh, the example is, um, uh, is on the north side of uh, Carmel Beach. And if you go down there and look, you'll see how that can be done extremely effectively and very long lasting. So I would, you, I would encourage this to be done. And um, uh, 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 I would go against Kimberly's comment um, and other comments before, it can be done in a very effective, long lasting manner. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, at this point, we'll be coming back to the council for discussion. As I do that, I wanna ask uh, Jim Porter, uh, we know you're having an exchange with the Coastal Commission, which we do have access to. If we decide to give further attention to this matter, uh, can we also direct questions to your staff and expect a response? I think all questions should be, why don't you send me your questions and I'll get them to the appropriate staff person. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, David, it's gonna go back to the council in the round table. Did you have a separate comment you wanted to make first? No, I'll wait for the round table. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, well, we'll before, you, before you do that, Let I'm sure, sure. Don. I'm going to sign off, uh, but I, I just want to confirm with Greg that I'm going to see you tomorrow. Okay, one o'clock. Okay. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a crowd, Don. Bring donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your mask. Does that mean it's not possible to reschedule so that I can join also? I'm very interested. Uh, We're trying to avoid you, Dan. <laughs> uh, okay, so council. Can I have an answer, please, Len? Uh, yeah, what, did, what did I do? Uh, uh, can I, uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, how about if I give you, uh, why don't you call my office to work this out between Greg and Dan tomorrow, uh, work out some times that work for both of you and let me know. And After 4 p.m.? It's pretty much a dark. Tomorrow? Look. Dan, Dan and Greg, please take us offline with Don and we'll can communicate it to other people who want to. Well, Len, I, I don't think we could take it offline because Kimberly and others plan on attending. I've already got I, Michelle. I think we had a number of people who wanted to do that. So I would be inclined. So I think we should do one tomorrow and then see if we can't okay. get another session with Dan. All right, we'll do okay. one at okay. one o'clock. Covered, thank you. Is that okay with you, Dan? That's fine. I'll I'll um I'll, get it up. Um, uh, I'll I'll work Greg. something. We'll work something out with you, Dan. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. So in coming back to the council, really, what we have uh, on the October twenty eighth passed a letter of comment, 
Uh, we've taken in a lot of input, diverse input tonight. And the question for comment in the council roundtable at the end is, do you feel the council should stand on what's been done to date? That is a letter on the 28th or would we like to have further discussion and consider things? So um, I'm going to go around in reverse order from before. So that means the first person up is Michelle. Okay, <laughs> put me in a tough spot here. Um, I, I would be open to, given the new information that we've heard tonight, I would be open to reconsidering uh, the letter that we wrote previously. Um, Okay. What that letter would contain entail exactly, I'm not I'm not sure at this point. I'd love to hear from the rest of the council, but I think the main thing on my mind is the length of time that it would take to replace the bridge, uh, to move the bridge to a new location, versus uh, the you know keep rebuilding it in its existing location. So the discrepancy between those time periods um, are top of mind for me. Um, and then the other thing I think that there's still a piece of information that I feel like is, is lacking and Kimberly Williams brought it up is really a lot. I hear a lot of opinions on what erosion may occur, but I do think in having someone who's an expert in that area come to a future meeting and speak specifically on that, you know, for that location. And it would be helpful to, to hear about that for even the broader Midcoast, um, that sort of information is what I feel like is still lacking. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Next up is Dan. Yeah, I'll agree with Michelle. I think that, uh, you know, there's some lacking information as far as the erosion. Um, clearly, uh, as one of the other um, members of the community mentioned, uh, the problems up in Pacifica, which I uh, brought up. Um, I, think ero um, I think drainage is a, is a big issue. Um, I'd like uh, I'd like Robert uh, I'd like to um, you know, understand from Robert. I, I I clearly don't claim to be an expert, although I've been watching a lot over the years, and um, I understand that, that drainage is a, is a big issue, um, and it's very important. So um, I'd like to. Um, you know, I, I definitely would like to learn more from experts, uh, as Michelle said, you know, uh, specifically regarding the drainage behind the, the pros and cons of uh, and how um, you can improve drainage uh, so that the soil behind the uh, shotcrete wall does not um, eventually uh, fail like has happened in Pacifica. Okay, thank you, Dan. Jill, you're next up. Thanks, Len. Um, I, I had a question previously that wasn't answered and it had to do with the prefab bridge. Um, so what my concern is, and I, I definitely want further discussion, the residents and the visitors to the coast want that crossing to be reestablished as quick as possible. So I'm concerned with the time frame for all of these different alternatives and have you thought of a quick fix just for now? Um, or is that just not gonna work and so we have to wait? So there is no quick fix. Any, any deviation from the project has to be re-permitted. It's not a matter of the design or that sort of thing. You have to start over with a new environmental review, new sets of permits, and then you get into design. So. There, unfortunately, there is no quick fix here with um, with the regulatory environment that exists in California. Okay. So I've been on many projects where they have emergency repairs, and one of them actually is very similar to yours at Moccasin, if you know that city, where they did Shock Creek to correct to uh, um, protect a uh, CD, CDFW fish hatchery, and it's huge but it works great, but they, it was an emergency repair and they broke it up into pieces and they, they permitted each piece yeah. separately so that they could just get going. Yeah. But, but, but Jill, in, in any event, it sounds like you would like further consideration. I mean, that's really all we need to. Correct. I just wanted an answer for my previous question. 
which I think he gave you his view. Thank well, you. Uh, just to kind of follow up on that, my experience with emergency permitting has been life safety issues that occur in storms, basically, um, where an immediate danger has happened. You go in, you do the repairs, and then you get it fixed later. This is not an emergency. I mean, this is something that is existing right now. We've closed the bridge. There's no life safety issues. So I'm not sure how this qualifies as an emergency in, in my experience. Very good. So Len, I would like further discussion. And I, I also um, agree that we should have an erosion expert and maybe we should have a permitting expert as well. Very good, got noted. Okay, next up is Barb and Barb, this will be your last comment from the council and thanks for your service and go ahead. Is Barb still here? I do not see her actually. Okay, go to Greg. I, I think it's clear the county's willing to spend the money twice. Um, the visitors and the residents want the bridge replaced in place and there's a priority on the, uh, the benefits from that access. <clears throat> My concern is coming up with something that the Coastal Commission is gonna shoot down anyway. And the people from Surfrider have raised some points. I would like to study those. I'd like to hear more about the erosion. And I've asked uh, Jim Harvey, Harvey, if he can provide a link to that project down in Carmel. I'd, I'd just like to get the facts to know that we're not, you know, going the wrong direction or going to get stymied, that we can go forward with this if, if in fact, we decide we're going to spend the money twice. Okay. So that's more study. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Claire? I, I think that our letter at this point should stand, but I would like to see us consider early in the new year having a study session on all the topics mm -hmm. that we've just raised and, so, and then from there. Well, the, the study session implies that we're having it because we want to make more comments or do you think we should just do something for information, but you don't want to see a change to the position identified? I don't want to do that now because it sounds like what we're doing is raising more questions than we're answering. Right. And I think any new comments that we would make would be based on inadequate information. No, we're not. We're only saying we want to meet again on the subject from what we know now. That's... Well, as I just said, I'd like to have a, 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 a opportunity to get more information in a systematized way. Very good. Okay, Dave? Uh, a whole bunch of things. Um, First of all, um, the existing project is already under an emergency CDP um, unless uh, the chant request for a new CDP um, uh, is no longer an emergency CDP. So perhaps um, Jim or Robert can answer that or somebody else on the DPW staff. Um, in answer to something Robert said uh, in, in answer to the first round of council questions, I would not consider 175 linear feet of armoring as a small amount of armoring. And that is roughly measuring off on Google Maps the amount of armoring proposed under the current proposal. Um, finally, or not finally, but next, um, in June of this year, um, in response to uh, a permit in Pacifica, Coastal Commission staff issued a statement saying that um, they, I mean, partly based on the Casa Mira uh, ruling back in November of 2019, that um, existing armoring is no justification for continuing armoring and extending it, um, that such a justification is uh, tantamount to saying that it's fine to armor the entire coast, um, paraphrasing their words. So I would very much hope Coastal Commission staff is going to raise massive questions about the amount of armoring here. And finally, um, I think there's an alternative six. I raised it um, in the last paragraph of the letter that we sent to DPW uh, last time which is a longer version of the bridge that moves the bridge abutments back and does not require um, additional armoring because the abutments will be far enough back that they don't require all that armoring. 
Um, so I note that in tonight's presentation, that was completely ignored yet again. Um, I see no reason to bring this back to the council until we have new information. DPW and their staff and their engineers spoke at great length this evening and presented absolutely no new information whatsoever. Thank you, Dave. On, on Dave's last point, uh, I do want to ask to Jim, the, uh, the basic question was, would a longer bridge span of a prefab type uh, eliminate the need for the degree of armoring you're proposing to put forward? Is that something you can speak to now, Jim, or should we look for a written answer later? That's you know, not hard to that is it, Dave? I'm sorry, what was that? I don't the, think that's what Dave was saying, is it? Yes, no, sir. what Dave is saying is, could we put the abutments back on either side to uh, remove the armoring, let the erosion occur, and um, preserve the bridge? Uh, I'll defer to Robert, but I do know we have looked on the north side of the bridge. If we put the abutments and the bridge back further, it's going to cut off access to that property. Right on the north side of the bridge, there's a residential property in there. So there's a limitation on how far back that bridge can be moved because we still have to preserve access to that property. Robert, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you. So yes, the, the point of actually preserving the bridge in place is really saving the foundations. The foundations are one of the most significantly large costs of any pedestrian bridge. So it is plausible to shift the foundation on the south side to the south. Um, on the north side, it's going to be a bit tricky because we will block property access. As well as on the north side, there is the potential for additional bluff erosion that would remove um, the abutment on that side. So um, we, we believe that this option is the, the most preferential option. Okay. Does that mean you, you studied it adequately and eliminated it or? We have looked at it and it's on the, the premise that we, we are seeking and the idea is to build a bridge back in place at the least possible cost. And since foundations are very, very, very expensive, this is really a cost effective way of, of getting a bridge in place without having to do a lot of expensive underground work. Okay, okay thank you. So at this point, uh, we've taken in our comment on item six on the agenda. We will pick up this issue again. Um, I want to thank the county for the time they spent uh, in the meeting today. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, at this point, the item A, 4A is closed and we're going to move to 4B, which is the election of officers for the council. So at this point, uh, we'll begin the elections. We have four offices to fill chair, vice chair, secretary, and treasurer. And so I will open first the uh, nominations for chair. We'll take nominations. Uh, when nominations are closed, we will conduct this as a voice vote taken by Claire. So do I have any nominations for chair for the council? Claire? I nominate Michelle. Michelle, thank you. I'll second. Seconded. Are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing none, could you call the roll for this? Uh, either answering yes or no. We're voting on uh, the nomination of Michelle for chair. Len? Yes. Jill? Yes. Dan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Dave? Yes. I vote yes. Uh, I don't know if Michelle, you can vote too. Sure, I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks, <Okay>. guys. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next position uh, is the vice chair. Uh, for this position, I was going to nominate Claire Tutank. I will second that. Thank you. Any other nominations? Okay. Claire, could you call the roll? A, uh, Lynn? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Dan? Yes. Dave? Yes. Michelle? Yes. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next position to fill is secretary, open for nominations. I'll nominate Len Erickson. Second. And seconded. Any other nominations? Okay, you call the roll. Uh, Len, I'll assume that you're voting for yourself so you can sure, are abstaining. Not? <laughs> why not? Greg? Yes. Greg? Jill? Yes. Dan? Yes. Yes. Dave? Yes. I vote yes, Michelle? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, for the final position, treasurer, I'll return the favor and nominate Dave Olson for treasurer. I'll second. Thank you. Any other nominations? Okay. Clara, the roll. Lynn? Yes. Greg? Yes. Jill? Yes. Dan? Yes. Uh, Dave? Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Michelle? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. That closes our elections. We now have Michelle as our chair, Claire as vice chair, secretary, myself, and Dave as treasurer. With this, it's uh, my pleasure to hand over the gavel, a pen to Michelle, and she'll conduct the rest of the meeting. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so item five is council activity. Um, let's see, do we have anyone on the council who wants to report on any activity? Yes, okay. I would like to. Okay, Dan. Um, it's regarding the lighting at the new firehouse, um, there has been uh, some discussion between community members and um, Jonathan Cox. Uh, the concern is the uh, bright light, um, bright white light, which uh, does not match the uh, community lighting, uh, street lighting. Um, it, it stands out, I've heard uh, some neighbors uh, immediately uh, in the area that it says it lights up like a football field. Um, so uh, I will say that the uh, there was a response from the fire district that says that uh, they need to have bright light to distinguish as the truck comes in, whether there's blood, oil, or dirt on the uh, on the vehicle. Um, I think that uh, there should be some further discussion uh, with the MCC regarding this issue. Uh, the community has taken great pains in the past to see that the uh, night sky and the uh, ocean views, uh, lighting is very important to the uh, members of the community. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, mention that there was that discussion that I was involved with. Um, and uh, hope that we can have an agenda item in the future regarding this issue. Thanks, Dan. Let's talk offline about that. Maybe you and I can connect and see if uh, if it warrants an agenda item. Um, anyone else? I, I have a question. Uh, at least in the part of the Planning Commission meeting today, and I heard both Dan and Jill speak, uh, but I don't know what the results were on any of the... Uh, there are at least three uh, mid-coast issues on the agenda and I'm wondering if anybody knows how they all turned out. The RV park was approved uh, with something in the half moon day review about it. With conditions. How about the Chevron station? Anybody know about that? I listened, but they, oh, am I muted? No, I did listen. They were, Going back and forth, uh, apparently Keatner Hands Project Planner wanted to, you know, minimize the, uh, what do you call it, planters, and they wanted to keep both of the openings out onto Highway 1, and they even got John Riddell from the fire department to kind of side with them on that. But I brought up the fact that that damn chowder truck is there right next to the fire hydrant all the time on the weekends and they might put the planners back where you guys wanted them 
and cut back on that parking space. But I don't know if they mandated it. I hate to say, I can't remember what they ended up deciding. I think it's going back to being designed a little bit more. Thanks, Ned. That, that's, that's, okay. that's fine. It's my understanding that there, uh, the two planters, there will be two planters uh, placed and all the access will remain open and there will be certain signs uh, that right. will be put up uh, as far as right turn only to try to minimize the uh, cross uh, traffic coming out of the uh, gas station um, northbound. Thank you. I forgot about that. All right. Okay. Anyone else on the council have anything to report? No? Okay, then let's move on to future agendas. So uh, we have an update. So we had initially talked at the last meeting about having a, a special media meeting uh, tentatively scheduled for December 16th. Uh, the initial uh, purpose of that meeting was supposed to be connect the co-side. We were, we were supposed to get a, a draft of that the week after Thanksgiving and that didn't come through. I think the current estimate for that draft is now around the 1st of January. Um, so we wanted, I wanted to propose, um, because we did all um, at least tentatively set aside uh, that time, uh, and we have a lot to get done. You know, we have um, coming up in January, two pretty substantial meetings, potentially one about Connect the Coside on the 13th and one about the child care ordinance on the 27th. We also have the potentially some more discussion on Medio Bridge, potentially the fire station lighting, and we have a retreat to be planned. Um, normally as part of that retreat, we have an, a Brown Act section of, um, of the retreat where uh, we hear a presentation from County Council on the Brown Act, and especially this is especially important for new members um, because you know there is this Brown Act that, that governs the work that we do and we have to be careful to not violate it. And so I, th I thought it would be helpful to go ahead and get that uh, Brown Act update on the calendar for the date uh, December 16th, which would allow us to um, have a slightly shorter retreat um, on a TBD date in January. So I wanted to gauge um, the you know, the option here of keeping that meeting, it would be probably just from seven to eight or potentially up until 8.30, but it'd be a shorter meeting. It'd be a special meeting just focused on the Brown Act um, on December 16th, next Wednesday. And that way we can kind of get that out of the way um, before we adjourn for the holidays and then come back on the 13th. Um, so can we go around the council and get everyone's take on that. Um, let's start with Claire. Uh, I'm not crazy about having an extra meeting, but I, since we do have new people, it might not be a bad idea. But if we do it, I'd sort of like to add a brief um, overview of Robert's Rules of Orders to order as well, because I think it might be useful to, to put in uh, some sort of framework exactly how we want to be conducting the meetings and what the rules tend are supposed to be but that might be useful i think you mean rosenberg's rules of orders which is whoever <laughs> yeah, see how much we need it <laughs> yeah i agree that would be helpful information whether we were able to do we'll have to figure out who gives that session and whether that would happen at this this session on the 16th or potentially at the retreat but i totally agree we could all I think it would be good for the community to hear what the rules are too, because then yeah. we'd all be on the same page. Totally. Okay, um, Dave, what's your take on that? I okay. really, really do not want another meeting this month. Okay. Uh, if we have it, can you attend? I may be able to make it, I don't know. Okay. And uh, Dan? Yes, I'm open to uh, another meeting and I, also, I want to say that, uh, just remind everyone that there was a community member that talked about uh, looking at uh, reconsidering the concept with the uh, uh, the road signs that Caltrans is pr proposing, the electronic road signs. So that's another issue that uh, could potentially be a uh, item. Thanks for that. 
Um, okay, Len. Yes. Uh, Jill. Um, I think that would be valuable, and I uh, understand Dave's probably knows all of this backwards and forwards, but it would it would, it would help me. And um, if it was recorded, then perhaps Dave could just take a look at it later if he wants. It's not a question of whether we do it. It's just a question of whether we do it at a special meeting or whether we do it in a retreat the way we normally do. Right. Okay. Normally the retreat lasts, I would say like four hours. Um, so this in theory would shorten it um, because we'll have to, we'll do it on a virtual meeting and that, that would be a long time to be on a virtual meeting. So. The idea is having this separate. I know it does require an extra commitment from everyone in terms of a date, but it would shorten the retreat that we have later in January or February, or hopefully January. Um, okay, Greg, are you available? Well, I want to learn. I want to learn, so I'm in favor of having that meeting. Um, I would hope Dave could skip it because he already knows that stuff, uh, and I think it's important. <clears throat> I think we're going to have a very long retreat. Yeah. There's a lot of issues that we face. I really want to get this out of the way. Maybe only the newbies have to go. I don't know. We should all go, <laughs> except for Dave. <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds like there's agreement then um, holding that on the, the 16th. Uh, and we would do that at 7 p.m. I'll probably schedule it from 7 till 8.30. The community would be welcome, um, but we will only have comment on, we won't have a, a general comment section. Um, on anything would only be on items on the uh, agenda, which is the Brown Act and potentially the rules of order. Um, yeah, Claire or Dave, do you know, or does anyone know who would be the, most, the best person to give an update on the rules of order? Probably Dave. I, I got a comment. Well, let me ask, get my question answered. Go ahead, Dave. Um, I, I've never done a presentation on them, but they're actually pretty brief. There are some very good online presentations of Rosenberg Rules of Orders. Um, I could just dig them up and we can play the video and discuss it. Okay, well, let's talk, connect offline about that. Okay. okay, so we'll plan on that. Dan, what did you yeah. wanna say? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I was one of the key uh, people on the in the council that um, pushed to see that the Rosenberg Rules of Order was uh, adopted, and I want to be very clear that the um, Roberts Rules of Order is clearly in our bylaws as to not be used. Now, um, when I got onto the council at the time, there was clearly a an issue with order, and uh, that was the reason that I pushed personally. Uh, to have the Roberts, uh, I almost made a mistake, Rosenberg Rules of Order uh, to be adopted. And it's essentially a very simple uh, version. Uh, as Dave said, there's a, you know, it, there's, it's very in, relatively informal. Um, there's uh, some basic cheat sheets. Um, I don't think a lot of time needs to be uh, taken by the by the in the meeting uh, I think that uh, most of the council members can just uh, uh, Google it and uh, you know get some of the just the brief uh, ideas about it it's it's very basic it's very simplified and uh, it's just not complex okay if you have any of those cheat sheets or anything or you could point me to those please do um, and then I'll maybe I'll connect with you and Dave um, on planning that just a small part portion of the meeting around that. Okay, uh, the next thing I just wanted to talk about is the date for the retreat, which we're not gonna discuss on this. We're actually gonna get some uh, availability from Supervisor Horsley. Uh, on just a minute, uh, we yeah. just have a, a comment from uh, Lena. She oh. did connect with the supervisor and all of the dates we proposed, he's available. Okay, um, so, I, the dates that we are looking at, I'll just throw it out there. And then I think it makes sense to do a doodle poll or do this not on uh, the, the Zoom meeting. So we'll do this offline basically. Uh, but the dates 
that we are looking at. Actually, Eric, um, Len, do you have those handy yeah. right now? The dates were uh, on Wednesday, the Wednesday before our first meeting, that's on the 6th. And then on the following weekend, the 9th, uh, on the 6th, it would be from uh, 6 to 9. On the weekend, there would be Saturday, two options. That's Saturday the 9th, uh, either from uh, 9 to noon or 1 to 4. And then on the following Saturday, the 16th, again, morning, uh, 9 to noon or afternoon, 1 to 4. So there are five options. OK, great. I'm going to send out a doodle poll uh, via email to everyone on the council to decide what date would work for everyone. Hopefully, one of those options will work for everyone. If not, we can consider additional options. OK. Um, was one of those the January 9th? I'm sorry, they got rattled off so fast. I didn't. Yes, it was. OK, I cannot make that date. I'm going to memorial service. OK. So yeah, that leaves the 6th or the 16th, we might have to put in um, other options. Just uh, we can, yeah, but let's do that. We'll throw out a couple other options. We'll get some uh, additional availability from Supervisor Horsley and we'll put that into a doodle poll to schedule in the next week or so. Okay. Okay. Um, that is it for the agenda. I think I, at this point, I need a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. I don't think. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll see you next week, uh, the 16th at 7 p.m. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.